Let me ask you a question. Would you rather burn to death or drown? A macabre question, I know, but one I feel that most of us have been asked throughout our lifetimes. It makes sense as to why as well. They are complete and polar opposites from one another. Water to fire, cold to hot. Fire is fierce, it rages about and destroys everything in its path. Water is cool, it's refreshing, and it's a source of life for everything on this planet. And unlike fire, which is destructive and painful, water is euphoric when you die to it. From what survivors have stated, when you drown, you feel at peace when you lose the oxygen in your lungs. Personally, if I had to make a choice on the matter, I would go with water. I'm not really one for pain. Sadly, though, this dark world of ours doesn't usually give us a choice of how we want to leave it. Such is the case with the Peshtigo Fire. Peshtigo was like a lot of towns in Wisconsin at the time. A town built on the business of lumber. With the high volume of trees in the state, it made sense to have it as the backbone of their economy. Towns were usually built on the sides of riverbeds, and Peshtigo was no different, building close to the river that it takes its name from. Peshtigo was settled in the year of 1838, and for years, it was a prosperous town. The folks were wealthy over the strong lumber facility they ran, though it would all come to an end on October 8th, 1871. The weeks leading up to the Great Fire of Peshtigo were dry to say the least. Sparse rainfall during summer and autumn left the woodlands barren of any sort of moisture. Still though, men had work to do, and one common practice during the time was to burn down small portions of the forested area. This was usually done for either railroad construction or farming purposes. While the true cause of the Peshtigo fire is unbeknownst to our modern world, most experts agree upon the idea that a group of men went out to the forest and started one of these flames. Quickly, with the forest being as dry as a tinderbox, the flames would spread to a point where the men couldn't handle it anymore. I like to believe that they tried to stop the fire, but just over how dry the season was, it would just be practically a minute or two before the flames were an inferno. They reached the town of Pichigo with no warning. From what witnesses say, it wouldn't be a mere minute until the entire settlement was ablaze. The large wooden structures being nothing more than kindling. People rushed to save their loved ones as well as their belongings. There's a report of a man braving the infernals to try and save his wife. When he came back with her in his arms, blistered and burned, he dropped down to his knees and proceeded to break down in hysteria. The woman he held wasn't his wife, but a mere stranger. This was a firestorm of such epic proportions that our world has never seen another one of its size. A firestorm in of itself is such a powerful conflagration that the flames make their own wind system. Winds from these flames are capable of reaching 110 miles per hour. You'd be barraged from torrents of superheated air from all sides. People sought refuge in a number of places. Underground shelters were the most common usually basements or storage areas for foods or goods. Either they'd be choked out by the smoke, or the flames would break through into what was now a crematorium for the victim. Another common place to hide was wells, or in the case of three men, a water tank. Those people would all be boiled alive. Those trying to flee the town itself would have to take the bridge, though the bridge would erupt into fire as well, and the people on it would be dropped down into the water below. Some accepted the grand fire as the end of the world, and walked willingly towards the flames. A father killed three of his daughters and then himself for this very reason, and with how the scene must have looked, it's hard to blame these people for thinking this to be the end of the world. The townsfolk would run to the river to escape the flames, though many were reluctant to get in. Animals were thrashing about, frightened to the core. Many of the townsfolk didn't even know how to swim, though they faced only two options. Submit to the flames or brave the waters. Most chose the latter. Getting to the water was a challenge in of itself, though. The aforementioned animals thrashing about, smoke filling your lungs, heat blistering out from all sides, and the debris that the flames launched at people. Many would perish before even getting to the river. 
Those who did make it to the water had new things to worry about. If your head was above water, you were at risk of getting burnt. People would keep their heads ducked under the water at all times to avoid the heat, or they would just continuously wash their face over. And while their faces were warm, the water was as cold as ice, posing a significant risk of hypothermia for many. By the end of the night, the river was full of corpses. All the while, the fire devils raged about, destroying their town. I'm sure many of you are asking, what the hell is a fire devil? Picturing some sort of demonic imp covered in flames. A fire devil is more commonly known as a fire world. Think a raging tornado of flames. The residents of Pashigo would have to watch all through the night while this fanatical tornado of fire destroyed their town. It must have been quite the sight to behold in the 1800s. A fire devil is capable of reaching winds of 200 miles per hour. They're so strong that they're able to uproot trees and launch them vast distances. Since they're able to grab trees with such ease, I'm sure you can imagine it being done to a person, dragged off your feet into a raging tornado of fire. Commonly, they would shoot up fire like a flamethrower in front of them and torch people fleeing from its destructive wrath. Ultimately, the flames would reach upwards of 2,000 degrees that night, hot enough to turn the sandy shores of the Peshigo River into glass. A survivor of the flames described the scene as, I chanced to look to either right or left, before me or upwards. All I saw was flames, houses, trees. The air itself was on fire. I find that the scariest event of the night is one shrouded in mystery, though. Floating black balls of flame. These balls of ebony flame exploded on contact with anything, dousing it all in fire. The best way to describe them would be like floating balls of napalm. One account claims that a family hiding out in a field covered in wet blankets would perish as one of these floating orbs landed on top of them, exploding and lighting the whole family ablaze. There's no concrete explanation of what these orbs are. Theories suggest things such as superheated pine sap or carbon byproducts. Either way, there are no reports of these balls of flames throughout history and without another fire of this kind, we'll likely never know what they truly are. By the end of the night, the flames had spread over 1,800 miles, reaching as far as into the state of Wisconsin. As well, they were over three miles wide and over half a mile high, practically a mini skyscraper of fire with that much height. The town of Pachigo itself would be burnt down to nothing but rubble by midnight, and by 3 o'clock, the denizens of what was once Pashigo were able to come out and look at the smoldering ruins of their town. They huddled around the fading embers of their town to keep warm. Almost all were injured, be it bruises, broken bones, or the obvious burning. Many were blinded by the harsh heats. The local harbor was largely untouched, though. With the large sawmill there, the townsfolk set out onto their first deed. Bury the dead. Coffins were made in the dozens. Many of the bodies had been burnt to nothing but ash, or their remains were so charred that they couldn't be sure of who they were in life. Survivors stated that so many had died that determining the identity of many of the corpses was an impossible task. Many would perish the following days from their wounds. The exact number isn't known. Those who couldn't be discerned would be buried in a mass grave, containing over 300 people. In Pachigo alone, over 800 had died. In total, 16 towns caught flame that night. And an estimated 1,200 people through 2,500 people met their end. Pachigo would rebuild, but it would be a slow and grueling process. Time, as well as blood, sweat, and tears, rebuilt the town. Now it homes over 3,000 people, and the fire is nothing but a story the locals talk about. Peshigo is home to the Forgotten Inferno, the Great Chicago Fire eclipsing it as they occurred on the very same day. Those who would live to tell the tale about the Peshigo Fire agreed upon one thing. They all witnessed a glimpse of hell. And thank you for watching another one of my videos. 
I'm sorry about the delay it took between this one and the last Roche Theralt video. I was struggling to figure out the camera, honestly. <laughs> I'm still a bit unhappy with the audio quality while I am doing live segments, but I'm tinkering and figuring it out the more as I go. October is upon us soon, and I'm looking forward to sharing a few frightful tales from that month in particular. Special thanks to Coag Music and Lucas King for supplying their music for content creators like us. You'll find a link to the outro music down below as well. Please feel free to like, subscribe, share, comment, you know all that good YouTube stuff. And if any of you have actually been in a fire yourself, I'd love to hear about it down in the comment section below. I look forward to seeing you guys again soon with a frightful tale for the Halloween season. Take care and stay safe.